Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a true Long Island welcome for Clark Jethro Gillies. Saskatchewan. I think Michael was afraid to bite that one off. But, uh, actually, there's a funny joke that they, uh, there were a couple leaving uh, the Phoenix airport and they were dressed in fur coats, you know, wool fur hats, and they had mucklucks on. And the woman was sitting there next to her husband, and they were getting ready to leave Phoenix for the winter, go back home. And uh, the woman says, "Honey, where do you think those people are from?" And she goes, he goes, says, honey, leave them alone, okay? Don't bother them. She says, no, no, I'm very curious to know where they're from. Look how they're dressed. So she, he says, you know what, go ask them if you want. I don't care. So she goes over and asks them. And she comes back and the husband says, uh, no, no, excuse me. She goes over and asks them where they're from. And the woman goes, oh, we're from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. The woman looks at it, she walks back to her husband, her husband says, so where are they from? She says, I don't know, they don't speak English. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, Saskatoon is a little farther north than Moose Jaw, so it's, it's kind of kind of cold up there. Uh, it's probably cold this time of year, too. But um, I want to take you back. Uh, people say, what do you talk about? I say, well, I've had a pretty interesting life. I'm 63 years old. Um, I've actually, as Michael said, I've been here in Long Island since uh, 1974. Uh, we moved here in 1975. My wife said, are we going to be playing here? We got married a year after I, played, I started. She said, are we going to be living here? Are we going to be playing here? I said, yes. Yeah. Well, let's buy a house. And we've been here ever since. So I uh, love it here in Long Island and uh, I'm very proud to be part of this community. Uh, Going back, going back, I was a typical Canadian kid, uh, you know, five years old, strapped on my first pair of skates, and uh, I asked my dad, I said, uh, where's my stick? He goes, you don't get a stick until you can go to the rink, and when you come home and tell me you never fell down, I'll give you a stick. And it was very true, because a lot of kids learn how to skate with a stick, and it's really a crutch. And I think the proper way to teach kids how to skate is to go without a stick. So I went... Off I went, came home, I don't know how long it took me, I could tell you a year, but I think that was a little long, but I came home and told my dad that, Dad, guess what, I never fell down today, and that's when I got my first stick. And that was right around the age of five, I played my first organized hockey when I was seven. Uh, came up through the ranks in Moose Jaw, played all my Pee Wee, my Bantam, my uh, Junior B, and uh, right around the time I became... Uh, I was 16 years old and I was ready to advance up to the uh, Western Canada Junior League. And lo and behold, the team in Moose Jaw folded. So now I'm sitting here in Moose Jaw and that was really my goal was to go through the ranks and then go play in the Western Canada Hockey League. That was, you know, the cat's meow for any kid that was growing up out west. So I had nowhere to go. And uh, lo and behold, the general manager from the Regina Pats, Regina which is the capital of Saskatchewan. Uh, he came down to Moose Jaw, about 45 miles away. He came down with a coach who happened to be Earl Ingerfield, and I think a lot of you hockey fans out there remember Earl, played many years in the NHL, coached the Islanders for a br brief period of time in 1972. Uh, Al decided to take a shot at coaching junior hockey, so they came down and uh, uh, talked to my dad and I and, and uh, said, we'd like you to come down and play for the Pats. We think he'd be a, a huge addition to our team. And I was kind of a humble kid. I, I, you know, I was I was pretty good. I was always the biggest kid, so I, you know, stuck out and I got a lot of ice time. And uh, he said, "We think you could really add something to our team." And and I said to Dad, I said, "I'm not I'm not really sure if I'm ready for the Western Canada League." I, you know, I was only 16, actually just just turned 17. And uh, he said, "Well, why don't you come down and watch an exhibition game and uh, let us know if you want to." maybe playing one yourself. My dad went down and watched, my dad and I went down and watched the game and everything went well. I said, you know, this is, doesn't look like I, a level that I can't play at that. 
He says, all right, so we'll tell him we'll play in the next exhibition game. So we play, I played in the next exhibition game. Uh, it was against the Swift Current Broncos. Uh, I think it was my first shift of the game. I got in a fight with a guy and beat the crap out of him. <laughs> and while I was doing that, somebody else jumped me and I beat the crap out of him. <laughs> and then the third guy tried and I beat the crap out of him. <laughs> so with this, my jersey's torn off. I'm thrown out of the game because I got in three fights. I'm sitting in the, and I go into the locker room and my dad comes in. I'm sitting in a chair basically undressed, and he looks at me and he goes, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, what do you think? I said, I think I'm a light player. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was basically how I, uh, I was transplanted from Moose out of Regina. And uh, I had a great junior career. Uh, my, I was very fortunate to, as with the Islanders, which I'll get to, but uh, my junior hockey team was Regina Pats. We had 13 rookies, uh, all 17 years old, uh, my first year in Regina. And we went to the Western Final, almost made it to the Memorial Cup that year. Uh, so we had a very good team. The next year we ended up losing in the first round because we weren't prepared. But the third year of uh, junior hockey usually goes in three-year cycles. So our third year we played in the Memorial Cup. and. Uh, Ended up winning it in 1974, which was a, a, a huge honor for, uh, you know, for any junior player you talk to. You know, the first thing you ask them, did you ever win the Memorial Cup? It's, it's, the, it's the Stanley Cup of, of junior hockey, without a doubt. So, so I had, was able to, to uh, I guess, learn how and, and compete at an early age and, uh, and become a champion, uh, you know, with a great group of guys in, in Regina. Um, I was drafted, uh, as Michael said, in 1974. I was the fourth pick, pick overall in the first round and uh, got the opportunity to come here to New York. Um, and as I was leaving Moose Jaw, uh, all my friends said to me, well, we'll see you, we'll see you in early April. You know, this team, team you're going to sucks. And I go, <laughs> I don't think so. I said, I looked at some of the guys on this roster, and you had guys like uh, Lauren Henning, who was played in the Western League. Lorne was probably the one or two or three best centermen in the Western Hockey League. Uh, Dave, Dave uh, Lewis played Saskatoon. Uh, we ended up getting Bobby Bourne uh, in a trade right before the playoffs, uh, one of the top juniors in Western Canada. Uh, we had toughness. We had Gary Howard played in Flin Flon. Um, Anybody who comes out of Flin Flon is tough, trust me. If you've ever been to Flin Tavity Flon at you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Bobby Nystrom, I mean, Bobby played in Calgary. Uh, nobody was tougher than Bobby, and then you, you throw me into the mix and a couple other guys. I said, one thing we're not going to do is get run out of anybody's rink. And uh, we started off the year uh, just a bunch of young kids uh, under the tutelage of Al Arbor, and we just played hockey. And lo and behold, we made the playoffs. Uh, let me just add, late, late in that year, we made a tremendous trade. Bill Torrey uh, is to this day an absolute genius. He traded for uh, J.P. Parisi and Jude Druin from the Minnesota North Stars. And they came in and gave us some real solid uh, senior leadership, guys that have been around, the, around a long time. And uh, we went and much to uh, the Ranger fans' chagrin, we beat the Rangers in that whopping best out of three series. So J.P. Parise got a pass from Jude Druin, and so they were instrumental in us getting through our first round, and, uh, and went on to uh, make it make it to the uh, Stanley Cup final, semifinals, then lost to Philadelphia. But uh, it was a real stepping stone for uh, for a very young team that that I think you know just just kind of really believed in itself. And, uh, and Al Arbor was a big part of that, uh, you know, making us, telling us every day that, you know, you got nothing to lose and everything to gain, and that's what we did. We just went out and played, and we played hard. Um, I look back to that 1975 playoffs, everybody now, 40 years later, still asks me, asks me about the fight with Dave Schultz. And, uh, I don't know. Sorry, Schultz. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so that was that was a big part for our team. I mean, believe it or not, you know, they condone fighting or not. Fighting was a huge part. It's not so much anymore. But back in those days, Dave Schultz was a tyrant, and everybody was afraid to go into Philadelphia. 
And after I pounded the beans out of them in the playoffs, uh, there was nobody that was afraid to go on our team that was afraid to go back to Philly again. So uh, it was a, it was a great opportunity for me to to come uh, to to New York, and I got to step in right away, which was beautiful. The Islands were building. You know, Billy Harris was the first pick in '72. Dennis Popper was the second pick or first pick in '73, and I was the first pick in '74. So it was a great chance I was going to be on that team. I really had to mess it up, which I didn't. And I uh, got a great opportunity. Well, a, a little known fact that a lot of people don't know, probably think Brian Trotche was the first round back draft pick, you know, uh, after me. Well, he was taken, Bill Torrey stole Brian Trotche out from under everybody in 1974. He picked me in the first round. And when it came around for the second pick, he said, we'll take Brian Trotche from the Swift Current Broncos. Well, Brian was only 18 years old. They weren't really drafting under underage players at that time. And Tory stole him. So every other general manager, I think, hated Bill forever after that move. But uh, uh, Brian came the following year. Uh, we got to play together with Billy Harris on the Long Island Lighting Company. Um, next year, Bossy came. We kept adding, adding players to the mix, adding players to the mix. And, uh, you know, we had solid D. We had uh, solid forwards. Uh, just fast forwarding a few more years to 1980, uh, 1978, we lost to Toronto. Everybody remembers that. Very discouraging for a team that was really supposed to win the Stanley Cup that year. And then in 1979, uh, lost to the Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> Rangers. Lost to the Rangers in, in 79 in the semifinals. But again, very disappointing, but. Out of all these disappointments, you know, what do you do? You kind of take a little piece of each and every one of these disappointments and see how can you make yourself better. Uh, same thing in business. You don't close every deal, but when you get knocked down, you get up and you go a little harder. And that's what we did. And one of the greatest things that happened to our franchise was in 1980, um, at the trade deadline, we traded, uh, unfortunately, Billy Harris and Dave Lewis. Uh, had to go, and uh, we got a great little player in Butch Goring. And Butchie came in, and he gave our team so much balance. Uh, took a lot of the workload off Brian Trotche. Uh, Butchie was a great penalty killer, uh, tremendous player on the power play, and uh, I got to play with him. Uh, I was taken off the Trotche bossy line to play with Butch, with Butch and Dwayne Sutter, and. Uh, wasn't the happiest person about it, but Al wanted it, and I, I was willing to do whatever I could to help the team. And uh, first day I saw Butchie, I said, I'm playing with you now. And I, you got me and you got Dwayne Sutter. And I said, I want you to know something right now. Nobody, nobody in this league is going to come near you. So I want you to make me look good. I want to take care of you. You better make me look good. He goes, Oh, don't you worry. <laughs> You're telling me that. And he was an awesome guy to play with. I, I just loved, as much as I love playing with Brian and Mike, uh, to get an opportunity to play with Butch Goring was, was really, really special. But um, he, was, uh, he, was, he was, as I said, very instrumental in, in uh, rounding out our team and, and taking us to newer heights. I, I have to tell a uh, funny story. Before the, uh, in 1980, we beat L.A. in the first round. We were going on to win our first cup. We beat LA in the first round, and then we went into Boston, flew from LA, went home, got some clothes, and went to Boston for the second round. And uh, Bobby Nystrom and I were roommates at that time, and we were laying in bed. It's about 11 o'clock when the news comes on, and, and we everybody watched the news. And you get to the sports guy, and the news anchor says to the sports anchor, sports guy, he says, uh, "Hey, Bob, what do you think about the Bruin Islander series?" And he goes. Bruins in five. He said, Bruins will intimidate the Islanders so badly. He said, they won't even want to play in this building, and I'm sure the Bruins will win one in that ring, in that building. And he goes, Bruins in five. Well, with that, I thought Bobby was going to go through the TV. At this <laughs> now, if you've ever seen Bobby Nice from Matt, which I'm sure a few of you have, if you have watched any highlights, uh, Bobby wanted to kill this guy. But then, after he stopped wanting to kill that guy, he looked at me and I was like, I didn't say anything. <laughs> he goes, no, Clarky, he said, you and I, we're going to make a difference. Last year, last year we, didn't, we weren't tough enough. The year before against Toronto, we weren't tough enough. So he said, this year, we're going to prove to everybody that we have what it takes to win a Stanley Cup. I was like, okay. He says, tomorrow night, he said, tomorrow night, you got O'Reilly, I got Wensick, Gary Howitt's got Cashman, 
Gordy Lane's got this guy. He went down the whole list of all the tough guys on our team, and everybody had a target on the other team. And mine, mine was O'Reilly. And he said, if anything happens, you got your guy, I got my guy, we'll all take care of these guys, and we can just, well, the next night we played, and uh, we ended up winning one nothing in overtime. Anybody recall who scored that overtime goal? <laughs> 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 We went one nothing, and there were, I think there were two minor penalties in the whole game. So the next day in the uh, in the newspaper, the Boston press just destroyed the Bruins. It's the Bruins didn't play their game. They, you know, they were awful. They played soft. You know, tomorrow night's going to be a different story. Well, sure enough, it was. Um, I had a first or second shift of the uh, of the game. O'Reilly comes after me, and so we go at it. And a shift later, Nystrom's beating the crap out of Wensick. And we get out of the penalty box later on, then I get into another fight with O'Reilly. And then I go into the dressing room. Yeah, Nystrom had fought Wensick. He was in the dressing room. I got another fight with O'Reilly. I went into the locker room. And then as we're in there, we hear this whole roar going on. I said, what's going on? He said to the, the Locker room guy, what's going on? He says, it's a brawl. The both benches are empty. Everybody's out there beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> and I was like, oh my. And Nystrom says, Clarky, we got to get back out there. I, I had to tackle him to stop him from going back on the ice. Because you can imagine, if he goes back out there, he'd be suspended for God knows how long. So anyways, the boys come in one at a time. Bobby Lorimer comes in. He had had a fight with Stan Jonathan. He had a cut under his eye. It was, it was actually not very pretty. But he was roaring. He's going, we got him, we got him. He's like, well, Bobby, you know, you're kind of got a big zipper going there. <laughs> uh, he was so thrilled. That, and everybody, as they came in, Gary Howard, as they came in, Gordy Lane. And this was a real turning point for our hockey team. Because we showed everybody, not only the Bruins, but the whole league, that and this is a different Islander team than we've watched over the last couple of years. And we ended up winning the second game 2-1 to one in overtime. I didn't get that goal. <laughs> but my friend Bobby Warren got that one. So we can leave Boston up two games to nothing. We go back home. I know we're going to get more of the same stuff. And the first shift I'm out there, I'm puck gets dumped in my corner, and I hear somebody snorting in my ear, and it's O'Reilly's like right here, right? So we're going again. So I got him, and I got him pretty good at that time. And uh, that went on. Another fight with him later on, and then Al Arbor uh, came in to me after the second period. He said, uh, you're not playing against O'Reilly this period. And I said, why not? He said, because if you get another fight, you've already had a uh, one-game suspension. If you get another fight, you're out, and I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you for a game. So he said, uh, I'm going to have Howie play against him. And O'Reilly went after Howard, and Howard just beat the crap out of him. <laughs> I was like, oh boy. Somebody said they saw O'Reilly leave the rink after the game, and it looked like he stuck his face, face in a meat grinder. He was so beat up. Um, but the son of a gun, we come back. Now we're up 3 nothing. We beat him in that game. We're up 3 nothing. We're winning 2-1 to one with 20 seconds to go in the third and fourth game. Not wanting to go back to Boston, believe me. It was not a fun place to play. And Terry O'Reilly, as beat up as he was, scores the tying goal. We go into overtime, and Terry O'Reilly scores the winning goal. So I got to give this guy credit. Everybody says, you know, are you and O'Reilly friends? And I said, yeah, I respect the guy. I respect the guy a lot because he was a real leader on that team. And, uh, and we ended up going back to Boston and didn't want to, but we had to. And we beat him 4-1 to one in the fifth game. So that was a huge stepping stone. That was a real milestone for our team. It really showed that uh, pulling together and working hard together, uh, you can accomplish just about anything. You know, believe me, fighting and then getting into that kind of stuff is not the pretty part of the game, but it's something that you have to that you have to do. Um, the uh, the one thing that, that that sticks out, I think, over over my tenure with the Islanders and some of the great players I played with, um, certainly Brian Trache was. Uh, you know, he's a he's a hockey Hall of Famer. Uh, Brian B Mike Bossy, another Hall of Famer. Uh, Dennis Poffin in the Hall of Fame, Billy Smith in the Hall of Fame, our coach Al Arbor in the Hall of Fame, Bill Torrey in the Hall of Fame, uh, myself. Uh, you know, we're, we're very proud of that, of, of that accomplishment. 
Um, but it but it doesn't come because you know you were a good player. It it comes to you because you were surrounded by by good people. I mean, we've heard that today. You know, you you're only one person. You got to have good people around you to uh, to be successful. And we had that. We had. You know, we're talking about a lot of this, about five guys out of the 20 get all the headlines. But those other 15 guys on the team, they have as much responsibility as Brian Trotsky or Mike Bossy. Uh, for instance, Billy Carroll. Uh, Billy Carroll couldn't, couldn't score a goal if he was, you know, hit, as they say, he couldn't hit the ocean from the end of the pier. And uh, he'd score one goal a game, one goal a year, maybe. But he was one of the premier penalty killers of all time. Uh, Lauren Henning. Uh, was played two, we had we had Lorne for two cups. Lorne was one of the best penalty killers in in, in the league for many years. Uh, so all these guys had a job, and and we basically knew as a team that if we had all 20 guys, uh, to use that old cliche, if we had all 20 guys pulling the wagon, there was a good chance we were going to win. And I really I really would have bet any kind of money if we had uh, every guy doing our job that nobody was going to beat us because. During one of the one of the cup years, I think we averaged five goals a game, and we were letting up two. So when you go into a game and you got Mike Bossy and Brian Trotsky and Dennis Poffin, they're probably going to be involved in two or three goals. So you pretty much win right off the bat. You got those kind of numbers. So, but it's a it's a it's a it's a huge team thing, and and, and everybody really has to pay the price. Um, I'll tell you one story, and it's a, I keep talking about Butch Goring because. He was a, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how big a part of it our team he was. In, in, uh, in the second cup, it was in the second cup, yeah, we were playing Minnesota in the finals. And I won't say we breezed through the playoffs pretty easily, but it wasn't, wasn't too bad. And we're playing Minnesota. And Butchie's having a great playoff. He's working his tail off, you know, through every series. He was getting all kinds of points, playing well, and I was benefiting from some of that. And uh, Butchie comes to me. We, we beat Minnesota the first three games. We we're playing in Minnesota the fourth game, and it was a it was a rough game. We thought we would win four straight, but they ended up beating us. And we get back to New York, and Butchie was a mess. He had he had, he had grew on this scraggly beard. And he looked he looked horrible, and uh, but he had also gotten kicked in the face. He had a, he had a cut from his lip that went right down underneath his chin. And so on top of the beard and everything else, I, he just looked like he was like worn up, you know. He comes to me before game four, game five, excuse me, and he says to me, Clarky, he goes, Clarky, I don't have anything left. He said, this is my last game. I'm not going back to Mini. If we don't win, I don't have it. I'm not going. I said, all right, Butchie. And he was sincere. So we go out there and all Butchie does is score a hat trick. <laughs> and we beat him five to two. And Butchie ended up winning the Conn Smythe Trophy for the most valuable player. And yes, please, the part. Uh, now this, this is a guy that's, you know, you all know Butch Goring. He's about, you know, five foot seven and weighs 150 pounds, you know, with a couple of five pound weights in his pocket. <laughs> and he was a tough little son of a gun, and, and I just give him credit for that. That He won the Conn Smythe for a reason that year, most valuable player in the playoffs. And he won it for a reason, and uh, it was dedication and, and, and hard work like that that uh, really personified what our team was all about. Um, I'll tell you a quick story uh, about me personally. I, I don't usually talk in, uh, about what I what I accomplished and, and things like that. I talk more about us as a team. Um, but I was uh, inducted in the Hall of Fame in, in uh, 2002. I, uh, I had been up for nomination a few times, and uh, I retired in 88, so 2003, I guess, was my first shot. No, not 2003. Somewhere along the line, I'd, I'd had a couple of nominations that I didn't make. It. So in 2002, I was on my way back to Regina, Saskatchewan, back to Moose Jaw, for my mom's 80th birthday. And uh, I was sitting in the airport in Toronto, and my wife... Pam and the, and the three girls, and, and they had gone to the bathroom, and I'm sitting in the waiting area to catch the next flight to Regina. And my phone rings, and it's my secretary. Uh, and she goes, uh, you have to call this number right away. I said, who is it? She says, don't ask, just call this number. 
and it's a 416 number. I said, well, that's Toronto. I said, I wonder who's calling me from Toronto. So I called her. And it's a uh, young lady says, uh, oh, hi, Clark. It's Kelly Massey. For, uh, I need to have you speak with Jim Gregory. Well, I didn't know who Kelly Massey was, but I knew who Jim Gregory was. And I go, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that. I just, holy shit. <laughs> and Jim, Jim Gregory comes on and says, Clark, yes. He said, uh, I'd like to inform you, 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 are the you are part of the class of 2002 inductees in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Well, I, uh, at that point I am a bawling mess. I'm on, on my cell phone, I'm crying uncontrollably. <laughs> my wife comes back and goes, oh my God, what's the matter? Is something happened to your mom? <laughs> I, go, I go, no, 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 I, no, these are happy tears. I just got inducted into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> well, Jesus, she starts crying, the girls start crying. <laughs> well, the people, the people sitting around the waiting area must go, oh boy, they must have got some bad news. <laughs> and it was like, it was, I couldn't control myself. I was like, holy cow. And, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, a nice individual award, but again, I wouldn't have gotten there without uh, the help of all my teammates. And uh, I get a little emotional. <laughs> but uh, yeah, a great moment. The uh, Hall of Fame weekend was uh, long. Uh, <laughs> Got there on Friday. I think I got about three hours sleep the whole weekend. It's a pretty wild bunch that goes to those parties, but uh, great, great reward and uh, great award. And I was fortunate to have uh, Al Arbor there with me and uh, Bill Torrey were there to help celebrate with me. So it was nice to have those two guys. Um, but uh, then it became, uh, you know, 1988, as they said, uh, 1988 rolled around when I was playing and. Uh, uh, the uh, Buffalo Sabres decided that I was not going to be part of the Buffalo Sabres anymore. And so now I, I, I kind of come to the end of my rope and I said, you know what, I'm going to retire. So uh, it was a tough decision. I, uh, I remember going down the first day of training camp of uh, the 88-89 season. Uh, still didn't believe I was retired, so I went down. Sabres were going on the ice for the first day of training camp. And I just looked through the glass and I was like, I can't believe I'm not out there. And I just turned around and walked away. And that was when I decided that uh, hockey was not going to be part of my life anymore. And I decided to go out and get into the business world. And uh, just to go quickly through it, I, uh, I got out of, uh, basically got out of hockey. I didn't want to get into coaching because I had bounced around <coughs> New York to Buffalo, Buffalo back to New York. My kids were sick of it, I was sick of it, so I said, you know what, if I stay in hockey, that same thing's going to happen. So I got a good opportunity to uh, go to work with Smith Barney uh, over in Melville, a uh, fellow that sang the national anthem for the Islanders, Joe Dewar, was the branch manager there. And uh, I went to work, uh, got licensed, got started studying for my Series 7 in August, and got licensed in uh, January of 1990, and uh, Joe said to me, so I got an office for you, I got a secretary for you, and we're going to put you to work. I said, well, I really don't know too much about this business at all, and, and uh, I think I need to go through the little bit of school of hard knocks first. So he said, what are you talking about? He said, well, they had a room. There were two brokers that had come over from Lehman Brothers, and they called them the cold, call, or the, uh, cold calling cowboys, but they didn't do any of the cold calling. They had, there were eight of us, turned out, as it, when I joined the group, eight guys that went in there, for you young people starting in the business, I'll tell you what I did when I started in the business. I got the Dun & Bradstreet cards, 500 of them, and I was at my desk at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I was dialing for dollars from 7 in the morning till 7 at night with a brief lunch period, back on the phone, trying to get leads for these two brokers so they could call and open accounts. Anyway, uh, after six months of doing that, uh, I went into my friend Joe, and I said, now I'm ready because I have been rejected so many times. <laughs> I've been called so many bad names from people who don't even know who I am. Because I never used my name. When I was cold calling, I would just call. And I would use the word, the name Clark, but I never said Clark Gillies from the Islanders or anything like that. I would just, I was calling people in California, Texas, uh, Florida. I used to run into some people in Florida that knew who I was. But uh, I just wanted to kind of 
dig in and, and uh, get beat up a little bit before I actually went out and started calling on, you know, friends and family and, and uh, a lot of people I knew had, had a little dope. Anyway, uh, it was a great beginning. Uh, I spent, uh, I spent uh, three, two, two, three years with Smith Barney, then uh, my, my partner and I, Joe, who became my partner, we left and went to Prudential for a couple of years and then uh, that didn't work out, so we ended up opening up a Raymond James office, which we had for 15 years. And uh, in 08, when uh, I got tired of throwing up on my desk, <laughs> I uh, went to work for a company in Garden City by the name of Hilton Capital Management, so now I'm a uh, sales and marketing guy. Basically what I do is go out and raise money for the firm to manage and and play golf with the clients. <laughs> it's taken me a while. It's taken me a while to get to this point in my career, but uh, uh, life is good. Uh, I have nothing but great memories uh, about playing with the Islanders, about growing up in Saskatchewan. And the joke that you all didn't hear was was when people ask, you say you're from Moose Jaw, and somebody said, where's that? And you say, well, it's about six feet from the Moose's ass. Why do you ask? <laughs> but uh, I've had a great life. Uh, I've had a great life. It's been fun doing a lot of it here on Long Island, most of it here on Long Island. And uh, I'm just part of, happy, happy to be part of your community and, be, and uh, kind of be here, living here, working with all you people. So um, I want to... Uh, I want to uh, open it up to a little Q&A if I could. It's, uh, we've got a few minutes. Yeah, I know you've got to get back to doing some stuff, but anybody's got a couple of questions, um, feel free. Go ahead. I'd like to make a comment, because um, I, I followed the Islanders and hockey during the time period that you were talking about, and everything you said is absolutely true, you know, and, and watching you guys, you know, play against the fly, play against the Canadiens, who were just you know, elite superior, what you guys did um, as a homegrown team is absolutely amazing, and you guys have to be applauded for that. So, well, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank well, you. We were, we were, we were basically built, built through the draft, um, something that doesn't happen much anymore. Uh, other than those, that addition of uh, Butchie, kind of got cherry picked there, Gordy Lane came over from Washington early on the trade with Parise and Druin. But other than that, we really built through the draft and a lot of those guys were homegrown players, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I, no, I, I think they got a, a, a very exciting young team. Um, you know, they're, they're a couple of players away. Uh, they got it. Obviously, the, you know, you hear it over and over and over again. They got to find somebody to play with Tavares um, and be a consistent goal scorer on his side, uh, playing with him. Uh, but they've got a good, a good nucleus of, of young guys there. I, lo I love the kids that are coming up. This uh, Josh Hosang that came up at the end of the year. My question is, where the hell was he the whole year? Yeah. Well, that kid was amazing when he came up and played. They've got some other kids. This kid Barzo, I don't know if anybody's heard about him. If you saw the World Junior Championship, uh, which was played at Christmas time, this kid Barzo, who is now playing out, he's out in the Western Hockey League playing in Seattle. This kid probably will be on the Islanders next year. He can really skate and handle the puck. Um, they've got some kids down in Bridgeport um, that supposedly are very good. So um, we have to get. One major thing, and Garth Snow, I'm not sure uh, what his future is, but Snowy's, right now, Snowy's main job is to sign John Tavares. Uh, they really need to put uh, his name on a contract or, or this team is going to be in serious trouble because he's a, he's a very big leader on this team. He's, you know, he not only leads on the scoreboard, but he's, he's a very hardworking guy that everybody follows by example. And uh, to lose him would be a real travesty for this franchise. And then you got the other issue of where they're going to play. Because uh, Barclay Center doesn't want them anymore. Um, they have a deal where they pay the Islanders to play there, and then they have to generate enough revenue to make it, you know, to make a profit, and they're not. And uh, so the Islanders will be out there next year. Now, the question is if you believe what you read, are they going to be at Belmont? Are they, they going to be at City Field? Or, and, Will they move back to the Coliseum uh, in the interim while they're waiting for a new building to be built? Or they may go someplace else. It's really up in the air. But, uh, you know, if they can get this team, uh, you know, in the right situation, in the right building, 
Um, I think the fans will come back. Uh, Brooklyn just doesn't seem to be working. Um, I travel on the train. Whenever I go to the games, I take the railroad in. I usually take a car back, but uh, uh, it's a, it's a difficult. It's difficult for the players because the players, you know, they all live in Garden City, uh, Manhasset. They, they're ten minutes from the Coliseum, and uh, they have to leave the house basically at two thirty, three o'clock in the afternoon to go to a seven for a seven o'clock game. But it doesn't leave you much time to do your pregame, get your pregame rest, have your meal, get your rest, do this and that. So it's every game. Every game is like a road trip. And it, uh, it really wears on these guys, but they're, they're used to a, a much different situation and none of them have really adapted to it yet as far as I'm concerned. So we'll see. But team-wise, I, I think they're in good shape, talent-wise. What do you think of the new owners? I like the new owners. I think John Ledecky, he's, uh, he's a hard driver. Uh, uh, Malkin, I haven't uh, spent much time with him, but I have spent a tremendous amount of time with John Ledecky. And he is, he is concerned with one thing, and that's bringing a winner uh, back to the Islanders. And, uh, you know, what that takes, uh, he's still working on. But John is, he's amazing. He's at every game. He goes probably half of the away games. Uh, he's never in his suite. He's always, he's in the seats talking to people, getting their feelings. How do you like this? How do you like that? And uh, so if, 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 it, if it works from the top down, which it usually does, uh, his hard work is going to filter down to the players because uh, they know how dedicated he is to making this team a winner. Well, tell us about your charitable foundation. Well, yeah, that's uh, my other. I don't. Uh, I, I told somebody I have two jobs, but I don't really have two jobs. I have one with Hilton, and I have a passion, and that's my that's my charitable work that I do. Uh, I started the Clark Gillies Foundation uh, coming up on our 20th anniversary in 1998. And uh, we've been able to do a lot of good things. We are now in a, in a major, we, we made a grant to the Huntington Hospital to build the pediatric, pediatric ER department in the new ER at the Huntington Hospital. If any of you have had the opportunity to go there, whether you're sick or not, uh, it is a tremendous facility. And we were able to, uh, through a grant from my foundation, uh, fund the pediatric area at, at the ER. But that's not all we do. We, you know, that's that's something that we'll be paying off for a couple of years. But um, we also give money to a, a little place called the Morgan Center, which is a preschool for kids with cancer. Uh, was uh, was started in uh, oh, I guess about 18, 17 years ago. Um, a little girl named Morgan Zuck. She was two years old. She was diagnosed with leukemia. So her parents uh, saw a need. Morgan couldn't go to school with the rest of the kids because of the germ situation. So the parents, uh, Rod and Nancy Zook, started the Morgan Center. And now you can go there on any given day. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be possibly 20 kids there, all under the age, probably under the age of five, that have some sort of, of cancer. And uh, it's a tremendous organization. We, uh, we give a, a nice grant to them every year. And I'm probably more proud of that than, than what we're doing at the hospital because to see, the, see these kids, they don't even know they're sick. And, and, to see what Rod and Nancy do to help them, uh, kids graduate every year. You know, if they have a little uh, commencement, uh, moving on, they call it the moving on day, and, and I go to that every year to see. I've watched these kids grow up. Um, It's, uh, it's great for me, it gives me, uh, well, it makes me feel good, let me put it that way. Um, so, so it's just, uh, it's just part of what I do to try and give something back. Uh, as I said, having been very, very fortunate here on the island to, uh, to be able to give back in some small way is, uh, is really what the, the foundation is all about and we're very proud of it. Yep. Don't make me cry anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, there are so few young professionals in the car industry these days. Other than pure hard talent and reduction, what are the principles that you carry from your sporting platform or athletic platform and help you transition into the business world? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I think a lot of things, uh, you know, we put a lot of time in uh, working on fundamentals, learning the proper way to play hockey. Uh, that was all part of when I first started with Smith Barney. I could have walked in and been put in an office as a sales assistant and just go out and call everybody I knew. And, you know, everybody would have given me money. That would have been the easy way to do it. Um, I really wanted to get beat up a little bit and really you know, be able to look at the other newcomers in the business and say, you know, I don't have a silver spoon in my mouth. I know what hard work is all about. And I was able to take some of the things, you know, I mean, we, we worked extremely hard. Um, Al Arbor didn't always have a smile on his face, trust me. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of hard work, fundamentals, working on things over and over and over. And um, when I got into the, into the broke into the financial business, I knew that there were going to be times when there were going to be disappointments. And just like losing a hockey game or a series or, you know, losing on the playoffs. You, you pick yourself up and you, you go at it the next time. And that's what I did in business. I, I had business that I lost. You know, you, okay, you're going to lose business. Everybody's not going to stay. But I think the one thing that I really carried forward was that you can't let disappointment stop you from being successful. And I took that again. I took that into the business world with me. And I said, you know what? You're going to get rejection. But you got to get up and you got to move on. you got to move on to the next one. I think I've been able to do that pretty good. And with that, my one last PSA public service announcement for all you gentlemen out there. Uh, I don't know if any of you uh, knew or what. I didn't, I didn't keep it too private. But I was uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer a couple of years ago uh, on August 15th. Uh, August 15, 2015, I uh, opted to go and have surgery. I had my prostate removed. I'm now almost coming up on two years. Uh, cancer free. <laughs> cancer free and, uh, and feeling strong as a horse. Uh, golf game's getting better. Uh, but my, I really do mean this uh, in all seriousness, uh, gentlemen, that uh, if you haven't already, please. Uh, ask your doctor to check your PSA. Um, don't be afraid of going to your, your urologist. Um, some men are a little scared of that. I had an appointment the other day, as a matter of fact. I went to my urologist and uh, he said, uh, take your pants off and pull down your underwear. And I said, all right, where should I put my pants? He said, oh, put them on top of mine. <laughs> <laughs> In all, in all seriousness, go get your PSA check. That's all I got for you today. Thank you so much. For